So welcome everyone to Howling Coyote for this week, this fine January 17th, 2023. And uh, I want to acknowledge that I'm beaming to you from the unceded territory of the Penobscot Nation and acknowledge their ancestors um, and their elders, past, present, and future. And here we are in Orono, Maine, home of the University of Maine. And I'll just mention that the Native Studies program here and the Intermedia program are sponsors of Howling Coyote. So y'all come to Maine now, yeah? And I'm pleased to have uh, Josie Conti with me. And Josie and I have known each other for some years. I think we're afraid to count how many years. And uh, Josie is a faculty at the Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency and is uh, has extra training in osteopathic medicine. And we're going to talk about osteopathy and trauma today. So I think it will be really fun. So take it away, Josie. I know you have yeah, some prepared so things. I do. Thank you, Liz. And um, um, welcome, everyone. I'm just down the road from Orono, um, also on unceded land, unceded territory of the Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet. Um, and I'm in Winthrop, Maine, um, right next to Marana Cook Lake. And um, I have been immersed in the studies of osteopath osteopathy in general, osteopathy probably since 20, 2002, um, when I had my first mentor who was our uh, family doctor, Dr. Greg Thompson, and he used his hands to really shift um, a pattern that my little one had um, of fevers every 28 days, like a menstrual cycle that was very frightening um, for us to see him go into. And sometimes he'd have seizures and uh, we've tried conventional medicine. And when I say conventional medicine, I mean, you know, what general DO and MDs do in a primary care setting and pedi pediatric setting, which was what? Lots of antibiotics. Um, and Dr. Thompson placed his hands on my uh, my son Max, and instead of having a 28 day cycle, he went six weeks. And I thought, man, that is cool. I want to learn how to do this. I was a massage therapist at the time, so I asked if there was some workshop or something I could take. <laughs> Naively, and um, Dr. Thompson said, "Well, no, this is medicine. This is osteopathic medicine. So if you really want to understand what I'm doing, you could go to medical school." And I thought, "Oh." what have I gotten myself into? But um, it's been a really great, great investigation. I'm so glad to um, have had that opportunity. So I went to school at the University of New England, which is in Maine, um, and um, was there for um, through two, 2006 to 2011. And Lewis, I think I met you in 2008 when I was a struggling medical student, um, very stressed out. And because of a mutual friend, our friend uh, Magali Chapman Quinn, who um, introduced me by bringing me to um, an EP ceremony. But, um, and I have been a fan ever since and trying my best to get to as many things that you're teaching, Willis, as you know. But, um, you know, osteopathy, um, for those of you who are watching or listening and may not know an osteopathic physician or an osteopath. Um, osteopathy is um, a form of medicine that was developed in the 1800s um, by Andrew Taylor Still um, because he was so frustrated at the way medicine was practiced during those times. In the 1800s, there were not a lot of um, uh, cures, so to speak. It was very um, allopathically driven where you're going to try to squish the symptom um, using 
mercury and calomel and other toxic substances, including alcohol and morphine and cocaine. And um, he thought, well, I think that there's probably a better way. So over the course of his endeavors of looking for a better way to help people, um, he, he was really seeking high and low. And along his studies, when he was uh, on the Wakarusa mission in uh, 1853 to 1855, he was living among the Shawnee and he learned that language, the Algonquin, Algonquin language in order to speak with them more fluently and was exposed to the bone setting and manual treatments he saw there. Um, interestingly, shortly after that, he called himself a lightning bone setter. So I think he did learn some skills and he sought, you know, uh, mesmerism and um, magnetism and eventually very much dug into anatomy. And so he started to exhume um, Shawnee bodies and learn from their bones and always carried a sack of bones with him and said, you know, first there's anatomy and after that there's anatomy and at the end there's anatomy. That was like what you need is to really immerse yourself in the body and he didn't speak about mind, body, spirit in the way that it's broken out right now in the modern um, tenets of osteopathy, but the way that he practiced, he followed natural laws. And, you know, when you are following, when one follows natural laws, you're following um, the sun is rising and we know the sun will set and there's times of day when the sun is hot and there's times of year where we get cold and, and times of year when different vi um, viruses well back then they didn't necessarily know virus from a bacteria but there's miasma miasms that are coming through different airs of you know um, exposures that um, you might use such and such he watched um, herbal treatments from his neighbors, the Shawnee, and, um, but he was very much about the, the hands and how do you help a person, whole person um, with their hands. So I know that was a really long introduction, but I still have more to say about, the, <laughs> about osteopathy is to make sure that people know that, you know, in the United States, there are two um, paths to becoming a licensed physician. And one is, through um, to become an MD and one is to become a DO or a doctor of osteopathy. And both have four years of training and both study um, anatomy, physiology and embryology and uh, pathology and pharmacology and all the ologies. And eventually um, you come out the other side with a uh, diploma that allows you to then enter into a residency program. And so MDs and DOs get funneled into a residency program. But the very big distinction is that an osteopathic student and um, well, I would say at that level, a student uses their hands. So we learn from our very first week how to help people's bodies and beings um, find health. So Andrew Taylor still said, you know, the goal of the physician is to find health and anybody can find disease. So what does that mean? You know, when you are sitting to find the health, you are looking at the person's ability to, um, to find their own self healing really. And so by using our hands, we help a person along um, in a way that touches upon the structures, yeah, osteo, uh, the bones, um, but also their tissues and the fascia and breath and the way the nervous system is functioning and the way the blood flows and the lymph flows and the glial lymph around the, um, the brain and, and through all those tissues and right down to metabolism. How can we affect metabolism in a person's body by using our hands? Take a breath. Shall I continue to go on or do you want to help me to um, focus a little bit about osteopathy? And I think the topic today is trauma. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's really good. Um, 
that's a whole other topic we could do a podcast on is Andrew Taylor Still and his origins. We certainly can. Yeah. So you know, why don't we move into the the PowerPoint that you prepared? And I'm sorry, say I, I'm gonna turn my volume up so I can hear you a little bit better, but I was saying let's move into the PowerPoint that you prepared. Yeah. I'm gonna share my screen. And um Tell me if you can see that. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I don't think I know how to um, share this this way. Let me try that. Yep, that's better. So, you know, uh, just um, on the 6th of January, we all gathered together. It was Louis Malmadrona, Barbara Mangi, Magalie Chapman Quinn and myself, and um, through the support of uh, Eptwalk Month and um, New England Osteopathic Medical Education Network to put on a day-long um, investigation on how to work with manual medicine and movement and story, uh, specifically for people who have been wounded. And, um, you know, most importantly, what we want to focus on when we have a patient or I'll say, yeah, a patient who presents, who's had a history of trauma is to be very mindful. So we need to be very mindful anyway with everyone who comes in to get a very thorough history. And some of that history is going to be um, obtained through our observation. We watch how a person presents themselves and how they use their bodies and the posture that they take. Um, because the body and, um, you know, posture says a lot. And of course, we don't want to make assumptions. And so we're going to practice good history taking to collect what we can from um, the person's history and whether they'd like to share um, specifically physical, mental, or other types of wounding with us, our hands might discover that some some kind of um, something is different in this tissue. So we ask ourselves, um, you know, let me move ahead. Um, you know, what do we see in this person's presentation? And what does their tissue feel like? And um, do we have permi permission to become close enough to someone to be able to treat? Because osteopathic medicine really is... Uh, it uses the hands in order to affect the tissue to improve the way the body can breathe and flow. And um, what I have in front of you, uh, for those of you who might be watching on YouTube, um, is just a reminder to myself that we practice a five model concept in osteopathic medicine. And that helps me may ask myself, yes, a person might be coming in with shoulder pain, for an example, and that is biomechanical. It's maybe it's about the mus muscles and or the, you know, a bone, you know, osteoarthritis or repetitive motion or possibly, you know, a football player having a trauma in that way, or possibly there is some other type of um, effect that this person has experienced that is, uh, you know, causing posture to curl their chest down, or they are feeling um, like they're having an awful lot of responsibility in their lives that they are unable to fully, you know, that they need help with, let's say that they need help with. So that's biomechanics. Um, we practice from a respiratory circulatory model. And so when we place our hands on a person, we want to read the body, we're looking at the body, we're saying, hey, how does the um, diaphragm move? How is this diaphragm moving? Because that is really a huge part of moving air, but it's also lymphatics and um, venous and arterial flow are penetrating through the diaphragm. Um, you know, how are they neurologically? Like I can do a neurologic exam and we're making sure that their cranial nerves are functioning and they have sensation. But what does their tissue feel like? Is there high 
sympathetic tone or a, a dullness in their system. So I, we, we learn to sense this with our hands and uh, somebody who's in a high sympathetic tone or who might have been living in high amounts of trauma um, can have a very buzzy feeling in their nervous system, in their tissue. You can feel it in the tissue of the, you know, the musculature. Um, we think about the metabolic and endocrine model and the way that that plays into a person is, you know, first of all, I might look mm -hmm. through their medicine list and see mm -hmm. that they have medication on board that they're taking because they have esophageal reflux or um, chronic constipation or chronic diarrhea. And I ask questions around that. And if a person isn't digesting well, then they're, you know, they can't metabolize well and their tissues are not being fed in that way that they need to be fed. And also um, living in high levels of stress can affect your digestion. So I want to ask these questions. And then the behavioral model is uh, trying to perform the best thorough um, gathering of a person's history as I can and time allows. And I'm lucky when I see my first patient uh, for a consult is I have a whole hour, which is a wonderful amount of time. And in that time, you can review records and really extract um, some, some story from the person who's in front of me. So I have to ask myself, what's affecting this person who's presenting? Why are they having discomfort and pain? Um, not sure, Lewis, how much we want to go into the um, Porsche's um, polyvagal theory right now. It, become, it can become a really wonderful um, bouncing off place for talking about the state of tissue. Um, maybe you can help me to, to either go into that or pass by <laughs> to, to talk a little bit more about the um, allostatic load. No, I feel like I'm doing a whole lot of talking. Oh, I can't hear you. My bad. I was, I was on mute because of dogs, but oh, dogs. they're quiet now. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, I think that, um, you know, the whole polyvagal theory is is relevant because, you know, fight, fight, or f or freeze, are really functions of the dorsal vagal route, whereas social engagement are functions of the ventral vagal route and mm -hmm. and it's really this notion that there's you know that the, the vagus nerve does more than one thing it has right. it has um lots of functions and it's it's really vagus in latin means to wander mm -hmm. and um I love the French word for for to wander. It's vagabond day, like to to be a vagabond. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, it's it 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 makes some sense because if we're if we're threatened, you know, we uh, move from concern to fear to panic to um, all of those emotions and if we're overwhelmed and we have no escape we move to helplessness depression numbness and all those things mm -hmm. so, um, so it's kind of a it's kind of a common sense model really if you think about it yeah and and you know, what helps us to heal, but social engagement, being connected to other people, feeling safe, mm -hmm. uh, experiencing joy, compassion. Um, that's how we heal, which is the opposite, of course, of flight, fight, freeze, which is how we run away or 
you know, a, attack or play dead like a possum. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's probably enough to say about polyvagal, just that it's there. And, you know, um, we want to we want to move toward the parasympathetic region of the curve. We want to be in the green. <laughs> we want to be in the green. That would be nice, and it's good to have the variability, right? And so, it's long. It's staying in one of those other um, states for a long period of time, and and in a repeated way that really takes its toll on the human body. So imagine. Right. Imagine that you've had so many, you know, you're you're so irritated over and over again that your, you know, your fists are balled up and your shoulders are up by your ears. Um, or you've been um, you know, it's exhausting. Very it's it's very it takes its toll on the human system, costs a lot of calories and that a lot of energy expenditure to be in that state. And eventually um you're going to you know, the body is going to shift into just shut down, you know, disengagement. And um, you that's what we see with our eyes, that sometimes how a person will present to us, well, can, do they make contact, eye contact, or do they, um, are they avoiding, um, avoiding gaze, or they are, is their voice sort of down and mumbling into themselves? Uh, because, um, you know, having having layers of trauma and frequent trauma can beat one down and um, be very overwhelming. And um, that's that's the shutdown that one might go into. And the, the reason why the vagus nerve is so important is that there are places in the body that we can check with our hands um, to see if we might be able to find some release. Um, and relaxation in the musculature um, to allow the vagus nerve to function in its in its most um, um, optimal way. And when it's functioning in its optimal way, it's in a balance with, um, you know, it's it's in balance. So it's not like the parasympathetic nervous system is always on, because that that would be. Uh, exhausting and depleting too, but that just like heart rate variability, that there is nervous system variability that you can respond to something in the moment and make a decision. Oh, this is safe. This is not safe. What do I need to do? Okay. I've done that. All right. We're okay now. And to going back into uh, that, that balance, that balance state. Um, the, the polyvagal theory is interesting um, just as a topic because in osteopathic medical school, that was not um, a term that we learned, which is like now, you know, learning a little bit more about um, trauma, I have... I've come to understand that um, it's a, it's a well studied and important to be able to think in those terms. And the way that we've learned, I mean, the way that I've learned in in osteopathic medical school was through the allostatic load, um, and that was like McEwen, I think, named the allostatic load. But the allostatic load um, is. Um, something that can bump you out of your general homeostasis and uh, it can be many things it can be um just how who we are as we've come in with because we know that we can also um be exposed to certain um traumas and triggers when you were in utero whether that might be um, nicotine, too much caffeine, or um, um, maternal environment and a mother who is stressed um, versus generations of trauma that one can carry in, or the neighborhood that one lives in, um, that can take its toll. Some people are, you know, have a general resiliency and some people are highly affected by their neighborhood or um, an unsafe home environment or lack of food, you know, that will take its toll. Um, just the things that we learn, how we learned to 
um, respond to stress. And we learn to respond to stress in several, you know, many different ways. I was thinking how, you know, our first yeah, close and close encounters, our first close um, relationships are with our mother, possibly, or another caregiver. And that's how we learn to connect with other human beings. Um, and we have mirror genes that allows us to observe and watch how others are responding and being treated. And we in turn feel what other people feel. Um, that's what one thing that makes us human is that we're able to make these connections. And the more um, time you spend making eye contact and receiving healthy touch and encouraging words. Um, sometimes you feel some stress because you're hungry. And when an infant is hungry, they cry. And that's all. That's the only way that we know how to communicate when we're small. But that cry is met by someone who's going to feed us. And then you can go back into feeling comfort and safety again and repeat this over and over again. So that helps us to feel safety in our bodies. You know, but what if, what if those responses are not met? So we might develop some um, coping mechanisms that are not necessarily um, healthy for our systems. Uh, if you watch the body mechanics of, I mean, they've done studies with um, chimpanzees um, who are taken from their mothers at a young age, but they've also just done observations of children in orphanages who um, basic needs are not always met and the amount of physical um, coping, uh, rocking and headbanging even um, that, that we have um, developed for ourselves to be able to cope with the pain. So that can also lend itself to our allostatic load, uh, just in general physiologic responses of being startled, you know, by a door slamming, or if you hear a door slamming a lot, maybe your body goes into that startle response and you release the cascade of catecholamines. And all of these will lead to um, an imbalance of our allostatic load to our homeostasis, and that can develop an illness. So this is just a, an image, um, the startle pattern from Tim Soar and, um, you know, cartoon, but you can see how the body, there's a, a tightening of the shoulders, the eyebrows are raised, um, there's the gasp inside and uh, the rise of the diaphragm as in an inhalation and the an internal rotation of the limbs in this startle. And then what happens next, hopefully, is oh, you look around like, oh, okay, that was just somebody slamming the door, or no, there's actually something that I need to run from. So your muscles are primed and you're in a state of fight or flight in this startle pattern. So the body tells us this startle pattern through um, various regions that we sometimes we refer to as the eight diaphragms of the body. Um, and so the suboccipital region is one major place where we can sense tension, but we can also help to release and um, ease that vagus nerve that's going to be affected um, from its natural flow. Just to remind, these are just reminders of watching um, the way that we might watch someone um, who's sitting across from us in the middle of a, you know, our intake and watching body language and what they come in with. Um, certainly we know what um, very emotional body language looks like. And when we repeat this over time, um, that starts to take patterns in our bodies too. Almost like a body armor that we can wear and we build up and to protect ourselves. We know that posture affects mood. And it's found that if you stand with your legs wide and your hands on your hips and take a deep breath with your chest raised, um, you will relax and have a lot more confidence in what you're about to take on in the next you know, few minutes. So um, it's important to be able to have a functioning body that can have that variability. So can, can this body um, make the changes that it, um, it needs to take 
in order to take a full breath and relax in the seat and digest well. So um, an example of a relaxed um, body that is probably performing a nice, deep, full, relaxing breath with the chest open and the arms relaxed. That is, you know, a posture that we might teach at the end of um, a treatment to send home with a patient to help them to find a relaxing space. Maybe not this extreme, but just sitting in a relaxed state with the hands on the lap. So, um, From an osteopathic perspective, do you think this is a good time to talk a little bit about um, some things that we might look for when we're um, we have someone our, on our table who yeah. is coming in with pain and who has said, "Yeah, if I, I've had these different experiences." So um, it's interesting that the there is a, a compensatory um, function. Uh, with the ocular region of the brain, with the eyeballs, um, and also with our balance, our vestibular system, um, that's cranial nerve eight, that helps us to keep our eyes level to the horizon. And when we are in a tight and startled response, the first thing we're going to do is look around and make sure that, you know, where am I going to run? Where's the nearest place that I can escape to? But you want to write that space with your eyes and at the base of your cranium, your base of your neck. So, so there's so much that lives up, um, you know, from the base of the skull upward. And that vagus nerve rises from there too, right? The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve and it makes, it has to be able to make its pathway easily across the tentorium, across the temporal region, um, in the temporal bones and then come through foramen magnum through the jugular foramen and um and then make its way down through other regions of the body so we might put place our hands under somebody's head and do a little motion testing to see well how does this how does this head move and are, but are the is, is this person um protecting themselves? Are they very locked up? Is there so much pain? We can't get that region to move well. Sometimes we use the eyes um, in different positions during treatment to help release the neck muscles and um, enhance treatment that we might be making to um, bring the muscles into a relaxed state. This is just a... Um, a drawing, uh, in, in envisioning what the dura and the flow of cerebral spinal fluid is through the falx, which is a double membrane that uh, separates the two sides of the brain. And this is the tentorium, and it's like a sickle, and it sits on top of the temporal bones. And then another... Um, doubled up region of the dura comes through down through the frame and magnum all of this area where i'm i know that if you're on a podcast you can't see it but um there's a there's a region through the base of the cranium through the occiput and then connecting down into the neck where the cerebral spinal fluid flows and also bathes the entire um, spinal cord all the way down into the core link of the sacrum. And the cerebral spinal fluid does this constant flow um, to bathe the spinal nerves and bathe all areas of the brain. And when we're in a state of relaxation, then that fluid moves the way it needs to move. And when we're in a state of constant state of fright, flight and tension, or we're not sleeping well, well then the gliolymph cannot flush the way it needs to flush every night um, and wash away the accumulated proteins. Hence there's more um, opportunity for uh, um, age-related um, vascular and, um, and cerebral changes 
over time when a person is constantly stressed and having poor sleep. I'm being told my internet connection is stable. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yes, yes, I'm hearing you fine. Okay, okay. So so one thing that um, we might focus on with our hands when we have our hands on someone um, is how is this fluid moving um, in the person's cranium and down through their spine. So um, we pay attention to the fluid fluctuations and those fluctuations can be sensed through the tissues of the body. The cranium moves and it breathes and um, it can be, well, can it be measured? Well, we've been trying really over time to measure and show changes, but like to one thousandth of a millimeter, that's really all the change you need for one nerve to be free, like to have a little more freedom and, and be um, bathed in the fluids that they need to be bathed in. Um, so this is a constant study that is being done in the world of osteopathy. Um, the cranial base and the suboccipital region is another really important place that we spend time in um, motion testing and um, sensing how the muscles of that suboccipital region and, and the space between the bones as well um, feel and how they're functioning, how they're flowing. So this was a reminder slide um, that the suboccipital triangle is made up of uh, six different muscles that, um, you know, if one side is more tense than the other, then you'll have, again, disruption in the way that the eyes relate to the horizon and also possible disruption of the way the vagus nerve um, makes its way and wanders down to be able to innervate our um, digestive organs and our heart and our lungs. Um, we need to um, check these different areas. They're, they tend to be places where the body can um, become constricted. So again, I had mentioned the eight diaphragms. One diaphragm is that tentorium, which is um, that sickle that sits uh, on top of and circles around um, from the tem temporal bone. The cella turcica um, is a part of that tentorium. And that's like a, a little diaphragm that the hypothalamus sits in. And then um, the next diaphragm would be this um, relationship of the cranium to the cervical region. So that can count as a diaphragm right there. And that's where all the suboccipital muscles connect and relaxation can happen with some uh, guidance sometimes um, there. The next place would be at Simpson's fascia. So you could see the vagus nerve is making its way down um, through the neck. And Simpson's fascia is a diaphragm that sits over the cervical and thoracic region. And um, it's framed by the clavicles in front and uh, C7 and T1, that's cervical, um, you know, cervical bone seven and thoracic vertebra one. And that's the region Simpson's fascia sits. So how's that moving? And is it breathing when the person's breathing? The next diaphragm is the actual diaphragm, um, the respiratory diaphragm. I have a, um, a picture of, but sometimes talking about a person's respiratory diaphragm while they're on the table and inviting them to place their hands on their own ribs to sense what their body is doing. So, you know, our if our goal is to help a person feel more embodied or feel welcomed and relaxed and safe in their body, then possibly suggesting that um, they bring their sensation and their awareness, their interoception into their own body and focusing on the diaphragm and teaching a person where the diaphragm connects. So, you know, you can do that now on yourself. So the xiphoid process, 
um, in front. And that's like at the, if you follow your sternum, that, that chest bone and right in the middle down, and there's a be gentle when you're touching your xiphoid process, that's a place where the diaphragm is attached. It's a really big muscle and it's going to be like a large umbrella that travels along the intercostal regions of ribs seven through 12. If you were to follow your own ribs lightly with your fingertips all the way back to the um, last rib um, down into your lumbar vertebra, lumbar vertebras one, two, and three, that diaphragm is connected to all of that space. And so helping somebody to um, become more aware of where their diaphragm is and how it moves. So if one was to take a nice full breath in, the diaphragm, um, when it's functioning well, would flatten and lower. And then the, there would be an expansion through that region. So we might um, ask permission to have our hands on someone's diaphragm, or we might help a person feel their own diaphragm as they're breathing. The um, celiac ganglia, so uh, this is a, what's piercing through the diaphragm um, is uh, the inferior vena cava. And um, the way that we learned this in school is I ate 10 eggs at 12. So inferior vena cava is the level of um, thoracic region um, at eight, T8. And um, 10 eggs means the esophagus, the esophagus um, comes through the diaphragm kind of, you know, yeah, comes through the diaphragm at um, T10. And then the aorta comes through at 12. So knowing that the diaphragm is moving allows us to also um, assist the vagus nerve and everything that's flowing down and needs to pass through the openings of the diaphragm that they can move as well. So the celiac ganglia is um, can get stunned during trauma, during shock, and the celiac ganglia feeds the stomach and the spleen and the liver and the gallbladder. And so that's a region that we might treat to help release and help the um, vagus nerve function nicely there. And then um, we move down to, oh, let's see, I don't have another photo, but I can tell you anyway, that when we move down into the pelvis, uh, the pelvic diaphragm is another region that we might check, and that's with the sacrum and the two anominates, the pelvic floor, um, the back of the knees and the feet are other areas of the body that we'd like to see moving well, because that is going to help fluids move the best and the body to find its best way to health. So when the body is flowing and moving, um, that's where the health lies through motion. I think I'm talking a whole lot. Well, Maybe I'll take a breath. Yeah, take a breath. We'll take okay. a breath. It's good stuff. And I'm happy for us to, to um, put it forth. Mm -hmm. Well, I love I love doing the journey through the body. Sometimes it's, it's really so nice to help. Um, remember how magical and genius our bodies are, how beautifully formed and functional they are. And um, to be able to appreciate uh, and celebrate our bodies. Um, I mean, in an honest way of celebrating the fact that you don't have to think hard to breathe. Like we can keep breathing without putting a lot of mindfulness to it. And you, one could change the way one breathes by placing mindfulness to it. Um, so the, the breath is an example of a place we might interface with mindfully to change our own physiology. Um, but it's the care and the feeding of the body that um, that's important we might forget about 
you know, if you are walking around um, wounded or walking injured or walking with pain, that we forget that how we take care of ourselves to get good sleep, how we greet the day, um, what are we lay our eyes on, the information that comes in through our senses, our five senses, is really critical on how um, our bodies can function. And so maybe we would be able to make um, better choices of all the options that are available to us of how we feed this, this vehicle of ours and how we put it to rest, how we exercise it and how we manage the stress to, um, to know that the mind, body and spirit are all one thing. And this happens to be one of the tenets of osteopathy, you know, the four tenets of osteopathy, they weren't written by Andrew Taylor Still. They were written by the American Osteopathic Association. And I think that they did, um, you know, they summarized in a nice way. I think that the four tenets of osteopathy are um, tenets that most um, holistic um, practices follows and believes, you know, who I think that we all, you know, if you're in the world of um, practicing um, holistic healing, um, or integrative medicine, acupuncture, you know, Ayurveda, and 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 good, um, you know, somatic experiencing, and and uh, we will will remember. We know that the mind and the body and the spirit are all one. And it's not just osteopathy. It's kind of, these are, it's, they're nice to think about the tenets of osteopathy and they're rather bland too. But um, another thing that we hope to remember is that structure and function are interrelated. So that means to me that, um, you know, if you're walking around with a lot of tension in your body, how does the vagus nerve Flow, for an example, you know, how does the digestive juices flow? So it's important to um, bring the body along when we're when we're looking for healing or bring the mind along when we're looking for healing and to 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 know and to believe that we uh, each one of us has the absolute capacity to self-regulate and to heal. You know, it's the individual's. um capacity, right, I don't know the right word, um, to find their own healing. So, you know, it's, that's the piece that, you know, I want to partner with, with the folks who come to see me to, to know that I, I can't do the healing. I can help, I can be a helper. Um, but the healing is when you leave this room, how do you take care of yourself? You know, how do you continue this state of rest that you might have found here? Um, the fourth tenet is that there are treatments based on understanding the above principles um, to acknowledge that we are more than our body, to acknowledge we're um, more than our mind, that we're more than our spirit, that we're all of that, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, these are really important ideas. And um, <clears throat> wouldn't it be great if medicine as a whole embraced these ideas? Yeah, yeah, that would be so, that would be really wonderful. It would be, it would be. And I wonder what it would take because the, the notion is out there. You know, I was just listening. I was listening to a talk um, by one of the instructors at Yoga Veda Institute, and he was talking about a recent study that mentions that um, wholesome living, wholesome um, dietary choices, 
mm -hmm. um, actually helps you to feel better. I I know that this is, I know we laugh, right? And so, but it, what, it, what he was mentioning was there was a, um, there was a physician who was talking about the study and they said in the same breath, oh, but we know that that's not really true because if it was that true, the people could help themselves. So here is a study that's been done. And yet they go back into this 1970s paradigm. Is that, oh, really, that doesn't, that's not really true. And people really can't do that for themselves. And so I feel like that's a little bit where we tend to sit. Um, we sit on one side of this paradigm, unfortunately, that um, doesn't believe that we can, that people can get better, that doesn't believe that there's wellness to be had, you know, that there's individual expressions of wellness. And um, that is just unfortunate. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? And and all of the studies that support in that people can get better are dismissed. <laughs> as they as, are, yeah, regardless of the methodology. You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, I have a study right now that I'm trying to publish which showed that micro, micronutrients and fish oil, you know, helped people with bipolar disorder. And it's a randomized controlled trial. It was done perfectly adequately, but I'm having the hardest time getting it published because the response I'm getting from journals is, well, this is nice, but it doesn't really interest us. Oh. <laughs> This is from psychiatry journals. That's so yeah. unfortunate. I wonder if it's, you know, why is that? Because it can't be sold or because... There's no money to be made from vitamins. And, and also they're considered messy because you have to take a lot of them. Whereas if you're, if you're taking risperidone or, you know, um, loracidone, you just take one pill and, and they pack it all in. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's one, you know, we're, I think in medicine, we're really committed to the one thing rule. One thing. Should yeah. Be, yeah. Not several things. So, and we, yeah, we know that it's just so not true. Yeah. But the commitment is intense. I mean, it, it's, it's a culture. It, it's a, well, you know, if you don't believe it, you don't rise to the top of the anthill. So but it's, it's kind of interesting because, I mean, well, for me, the principles of osteopathy are, are fabulous, but so many osteopaths don't want to do it no there's only five percent of the osteopathic physicians actually work with their hands five percent and and osteopathic physicians well this is in the united states at least do's make up t about 25 percent of the physicians who are practicing so then of the, of the 25 percent of those physicians practicing five percent are really doing osteopathy and isn't that amazing um it's heartbreaking and you know um in in some ways it's there's there's hope because more mds want to learn osteopathic principles and philosophy and i know you do i know you work with your hands and you know i would consider you osteopathic um, and now that we're educating physicians under one um, umbrella, doing ACGME, that um, when a person is in their residency, if an MD um, would like to learn osteopathy or at least osteopathic philosophy and manual treatment, they have they should be able to 
um, in any residency program that says that it's as an osteopathic recognition track. So that means that it can be brought into more hands. But I feel hopeful in that way. And and it's so it's so bizarre because it works. I mean, it, yeah. it's so effective, and and giving pills for back pain is so ineffective. Like nothing changes. No, no one gets better. No. And and it's so, but it's quick. I guess that's that's where the pendulum sort of swings is that we prefer quick things that don't work to longer things that do work. Well, look at the way that our society eats and just how many people buy fast food mm -hmm. that is not nourishing, but is quick. We have been brainwashed um into believing that this is how we want you know how we should do things but i think i think when when a physician when or, or any anybody who's in a position to talk to people can um you know discuss real real meaning in wellness and um i think that there can be changes and i think that um one you know you can feel you can feel better um, maybe just for a few moments, but in that few moments, there's a little bit, there's like a little ray of sunshine and hope that one might feel like, oh, I, I like that. That felt really good when I was resting on the table or when you put your hand on my shoulder, that felt really good. Oh, there's ways of um, making that feel, that making, you know, helping you to find that on your own. Um, and just, you know, you just have to resist, <laughs> resist the clock. We yeah. have to resist the clock and um, and continue to carry on in, in a way that um, insists that people deserve some time and they they deserve to be um, treated as you know individuals and they deserve to be treated respectfully and you know that's that's it too is that when you when you do individualized medicine it takes a little time. Because it's yeah. not just like one size fits all. Here, take this pill, 20 milligrams. There you go, every day. We'll check in in six weeks. It's like, no, there. <laughs> we have to find out, like, what is the root cause of why this person is feeling like that? Let's get to that. Let's talk yeah. about what you're eating. Who are you eating with, right? So, um, yeah, I. Yeah, it reminds me of the, I, what, once upon a time, when I was working in Tucson, Arizona, I saw a guy who'd had a heart transplant and he gained a hundred pounds, mm. which was not desirable no. for his heart. And I asked him, I said, so what's up? You know, what's this all about? And he said, well, I'd rather eat with my family and die sooner than not eat with my family and live longer. And it was so profound because I realized that belonging is more important than life itself. And that um, if we actually wanted to make a dent in his situation, we would have brought the whole family in yeah. and and looked at how many calories do you need in a day? You know, like, um, and how, and how do we achieve that goal? And, you know, that's what Weight Watchers does and Noom and all those programs. They say, well, you can eat what you want but you have to look at the size of what you eat that you want. And, yeah. and also at the, well, we, we were checking out Noom. Barbara subscribed for, my Barbara, my wife, subscribed for a month just to check it out. And it's really basic CBT yeah. that 
looking at like, so why are you eating in this moment? Are you hungry, anxious, sad? What What's going on? And, um, and it's amazing because the, the weight loss industry in the United States is mega business, is huge business. And yet here are these really basic CBT concepts. And um, we physicians don't seem to be able to pull off anything like that. I mean, Zoom is a really good program because they have those little education moments and they also can connect you should you choose to do the social part of it that you are communicating with um, some people as well. So it kind of plugs you in to people who are on the same track and educates you of what what does good food look like what is you know healthy food is what i mean um and what does a portion look like and yeah how are you feeling and how are you moving your body and how much water are you drinking all of those things and uh, they think they've got a pretty it's a smart it's a very smart program i think i did it for a year mm. and um i was really happy I think I lost 10 pounds, which was not very tall. So 10 pounds was a big deal. And uh, it was just a behavioral change. And I really, I wanted to feel it, you know, I wanted to feel what that felt like because I, but it's a, it was good. Um, it was yeah. helpful and uh, yeah, smart. But um, I wish, I wish that, you know, maybe like shared, shared office visits um, might be one way that a physician could be more effective is if you created a little bit of a community there, um, time, can, no, it's kind of saves time in a way because you can do the education and have different topics. So you're, you're, you do really beautiful groups. Uh, I remember as a medical student, I'm spending time with you and, and Barbara um, in Vermont when you were running, um, I think complicated minds. And then there was a second group, but uh but those groups run themselves. I mean, in when it, you, I know you must have been working with them for a really long time to get to that place where, you know, I think Barbara was facilitating and the people were talking and encouraging one another. And then from a, you know, your 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 doctor job was to um, to do a portion that you could do because the entire thing worked in this beautiful way, and you were creating a community there. So. Maybe that's a way to help spread more um, information on self-care. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. And it's hard to duplicate because at least in Maine, people don't want to come to groups. That's what I've observed. I, yeah. a, you know, which was good for the pandemic because, you know, when Mainers heard that they had to be two meters apart, they said, what do you mean? That's much too close. You <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. It's more like a kilometer <laughs> apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that basic dislike for other humans is the reason that Maine did well in the pandemic. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah. You have to pass the test before you can become a Mainer. Right. Yeah. That, <laughs> can you spend it take... long periods of time by yourself? <laughs> doesn't it cold. take seven generations? Also? Yeah, yeah. 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 So you and I are hopelessly unmainers. We are definitely hopelessly unmainer. My son was born in Maine, but there's some people who are from Maine originally who accept him and say, you know, say, oh yeah, I guess you can call him a Mainer. And others who say, just because you got a cat has biscuits in it. Wait, what is it? Just because a cat has kittens in the oven, don't make them biscuits. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> 
right it's seven generations yeah, yeah. yeah. seven generations yeah. <laughs> oh well all right well i think i think we've come to a stopping point okay now that yeah. we established that mainers hate people <laughs> <laughs> less colds to spread but i thank you so much for inviting me here and letting me talk yeah. about well, an thank, enemy. You for, thank you so much for doing this yeah my pleasure yeah